Well, hi, everyone. I have the pleasure today of speaking with Nicholas Kramer, the principal guest conductor of Music of the Baroque, who joins us from London. I'm here in our office, Music of the Baroque's office in Chicago. Uh, Nicholas, welcome. Great to see you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. So, you know, we've been missing you and all our musicians because of the coronavirus pandemic, and we were looking forward to having you here in the fall to do the Brandenburg Concertos by Bach and then Handel's Messiah. So those concerts are going to move into next year now, the first half of next year. But what's all of this like for you as a professional musician? Because the coronavirus has been tough on everyone, but I think particularly traveling conductors and musicians and soloists and musicians everywhere. Yeah, it certainly has. And I mean, there's, um, th there's been no action uh, from me uh, for the last uh, few months in, in terms of live music making. Some people managed to do it, uh, you know, doing stuff in their front room and joining up with other musicians and managing to, to do some amazing stuff. Um, I am not actually, and I'm quite happy not to, although I do miss, I miss seeing you guys. I miss live music so much. Um, and it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be so extraordinary when we do start again, if we ever do, um, <laughs> of course we will, we um, will. <laughs> it, it's, uh, th there's something, it just, it makes you realize, uh, what, uh, as a musician, how important live music making is. Um, I mean, I, I've been, funnily enough, I've been listening to a lot of recordings recently of, of mine, which I'm trying to sort of uh, put into some sort of order. Um, and, and I think, oh yeah, I remember that. And I remember how I felt during that and all that. But, you know, th there isn't anything, absolutely nothing like what we do uh, for a living. And, uh, ha and of course, you realize how lucky you are when you're missing it. That's the thing. You realize you how lucky you are to have this um, profession when you're not doing it because you miss it so much. Absolutely. I mean, life is a full circle, isn't it? And we have our economic needs. We have our working professional needs, our personal needs, our, you know, um, nutritional needs, all of that. But, but without music and art, there's a, there's a huge emptiness there. Yeah, I mean, you've, you feel literally starved of, um, I mean, as a, as a performer, I feel starved of um, contact. I mean, the contact with players, contact with audiences, because, you know, I do like to talk, as you know, and um, I, I like to hear people laugh, not just clap. And um, so that's all missing terribly. Um, Absolutely. But hopefully we'll get going again in January and uh, we'll look forward to doing, continuing to do. So we regard these as postponements, not cancellations. So Absolutely. a little later in the interview, I want to ask you about the Brandenburgs and indeed Messiah, sure. you know, two great monumental Baroque uh, mm -hmm. masterpieces. Um, and, but, you know, before we get there, I think this pandemic has given us all a chance to reflect and, uh, think a lot about the past, also think about the future. But let's talk a little bit about your past and yeah. how you got to, you know, where you are now in life. And just to recap a little, I think a lot of our audience will be familiar with this already. Um, but for our wider audience, um, you were actually born in Scotland 75 years ago, but you spent most of your life, in fact, all of your life really in London, both studying and then professionally. And then you've had these incredible, I mean, we know you from your work with music of the Baroque, but you've also been so closely associated with many other great ensembles like the English Chamber Orchestra and the Manchester Camerata, Irish Chamber Orchestra, um, Opera 80, which became English Touring Opera. And then all these orchestras in Germany, including you've worked with the Berlin Philharmonic, and of course, all over America, Minnesota, Detroit, and the CSO here in Chicago. So the journey to get to do all of that, what would you say are the two or three most important things that led you on this amazing journey? It's a, it, this was a tough one. And um, <laughs> when you say two or three, I'm thinking of 20 or 30. 
Um, but I suppose um, I was very lucky to be brought up, to have been brought up in a musical family. My mother was an amateur violinist, and uh, you know this 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 will become relevant, of course, in the later on in the conversation when my probably my sort of road to Damascus moment was uh, hearing a rehearsal of Messiah when I was about eight or nine. I was already an instrumentalist by then, but I hadn't, I hadn't ever knowingly been moved by music until that moment. Um, it was in Edinburgh on the 1st of January, some year or other in 50, 19, in the 1950s. Um, and I thought, ah, well, um, this is what, this is what's been going on or, or you know, with, with my mum playing the violin and this is what's been going on up until now and now I'm going to do something about it. And indeed, um, I did feel that that was a springboard hearing that. I mean, just being completely filled with, with, uh, with absolute love and um, enjoyment and just really being moved. I mean, I don't know how it was. And I was sitting on by, by myself in the Usher Hall. You know, there wasn't anybody else there. Um, and it was an extraordinary thing. It's a bit like, like you might do now in the pandemic, you know, sit, sit on your own in a hall. Um, so then, I, you know, fast forward many, many years. Um, I, I went to university and I, uh, I studied academic music and there was very little practical stuff going on, but I, I was very keen on the harpsichord. So, you know, I thought maybe I should try and get one. So I had one made and, um, and I used to carry it on the top of my mini uh, to gigs. You see, if you had a harpsichord, you're more likely to get engaged than <laughs> if you didn't. So it went on the top and I strapped it on and it, it got wet sometimes, but it was, it was a pretty tough old beast. And so, yeah, I, I, I got started uh, playing continuo with a lot of groups, um, student groups, and then, vert, you know, some, some uh, professional groups. And um, I suppose the interesting, the, the English Chamber Orchestra was the first orchestra, uh, the first sort of, uh, yeah, so the, the, the first big time orchestra that, um, that, that booked me. Um, and that was because the, the, there was a scout coming to listen to a violinist and he heard me as well. And there, were there, and there it all started. So I was eight years with them. And then the, the conducting thing really became sort of um, almost by mistake, because as you were sitting at the harpsichord, some people would ask you, oh, you know, how do we do this? because you're the expert. Um, so I said, well, you do it this way and, and you know, try to use a bit less bow and this and, and eventually he said, oh, just start us off, would you? And <laughs> you think, oh, before you know where you are, you, you, you're actually beating, to, beating. And then of course, it'd be better if I sat at the front. Yes, okay, you sit at the front. And then, you know, it was sort of, it wasn't my plan, uh, really it wasn't. I wanted to be a continuo player with the best groups and I sort of achieved that quite early on. I toured with the Academy of St. Martins for 10, 12 years and, and John Elliott Gardner's group as well um, for about the same amount of time. But, you know, in the meantime, I was doing bits and pieces of conducting. I wasn't trying to, I was just waiting for things to happen. A lot of my, a lot of my um, uh, colleagues, uh, contemporaries were had an absolutely burning ambition to be the best group in the world. I, I did have a group, but, you know, I thought my group was the best group in the world, but I didn't sort of think, well, you know, I, I've got to shout and scream about it. So I didn't. And, you know, I, I sort of, as a result, uh, covered a huge amount of ground in terms of groups and, um, you know, getting guest, guest conducting. So I didn't, you know, I, I did stuff with my group, but it, it wasn't anything like to the exclusion that other of my colleagues were, would have done. You know, you, the usual suspects in the 80s and 90s who are still going, of course. And, um, 
you know, have, have done a great job. So it sounds like a natural evolution, but, but you were well placed because I think when you're a harpsichordist, as you say, you're right at the center of the whole thing. And, and it's a very good vantage point, I guess, in terms of going on to then develop those directorial skills and then ultimately getting on the podium uh, to conduct. But of course, you can direct from the keyboard from the harpsichord as well. So of course, it opened up so many opportunities. It's, it's a great vantage point. It's, it's right at the heart of the certainly Baroque ensembles to be you know, filling out those harmonies uh, and to propel the music forward. So it was, it was a great grounding. But the, this idea of directing from the harpsichord was uh, pretty recent because, I mean, of course they did it in, in the 18th century. Um, maybe not in the way that they do it now, but, you know, my great hero was Raymond Leppard because he did it in such a way that it just like, it, it just seemed that he was just bouncing, bouncing the music around. Um, I mean, his, his interpretations always had a tremendous amount of bounce. And uh, he literally did that at the harpsichord. And I remember watching him direct Messiah. Um, let me think, that was a very, very long time ago, probably in the late, in the mid 60s, um, in a cinema in Swiss Cottage, the Odeon Swiss Cottage with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. And he was directing Messiah from the harpsichord. And I thought, my God, I've never seen anybody do anything like this. <laughs> and, um, and of course, I do only this now. I never conduct a Messiah without the harpsichord in front of me. Um, and so it started off with him. And I have to say, he died very sadly, uh, very recently um, in his 90s. Um, he did, I, I went to one of his Chicago shows when he did uh, Chicago Opera Theatre and went round and saw him. And I just said to him, you know, you don't realise how grateful I am to you. I mean, the thing is, his style never really quite caught up with the, with the, uh, the you know, the sort of um, period instrument performances that have, but that doesn't matter. He had such spirit for it. And I, I, I'm so grateful to him. And, and I thank, I was glad I was able to thank him for that. Wonderful. So uh, here at Music of the Baroque, we're approaching our 50th anniversary, our 50th season. You've been principal guest conductor for almost 20 years now. When you look back on, you mentioned that you're organizing your recordings at the moment. Could you pick out maybe two or three from your work with music of the Baroque that have really stood out? Well, um, the St. John Passion I did, I think in 2004 or five, was, was quite memorable. Um, we, I, I'd done it, I suppose, quite a lot, and I was doing it a lot around that time. But there was something very special. It was before we had the Harris Theatre. Um, so we were in various churches. Um, and th there was something very special about doing the St. John Passion. And of course, nearly always, I was doing these passions, these choral works with amateur choirs. And it was just such a thrill to do it with a, a professional choir that had an enjoyment, a sense of enjoyment, you know, because sometimes, you face a professional choir and they're sitting there, sitting, I say, not standing, with their newspapers up and, um, and you know, what's he got to say? And this happens over this side of the pond a bit. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't see that because the music of the Baroque chorus is something completely special and unique. And, um, it, and you, you, you get that feeling from the way they sing and the way they perform. It's just so wonderful to watch and listen. So that St. John Passion was, was, was a great um, spur to me to, to, to know that, you know, I, sometimes you feel very in awe of these big works and um, I, I still am, but I was able to steer it somehow in a way that I wanted it to go which hadn't been always the case up till then.
uh, another one. Well, I remember having a lot of fun uh, in, I don't, I don't know, I can't remember the dates, but we had, a, we had a, I know we had a threes company quite recently, but a long time ago we did triple concertos. Um, and one of the ones was the Mozart triple concerto um, on 340 pianos, which David Schrader produced um, and played, of course, uh, with a mate of his. And we played that. We had to, <laughs> it took the whole interval to set it up. So we had to just um, have the Mozart concerto in the second half because there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't time to take them away again. And I also remember that that was fun. And I also remember that David played Brandenburg Five on the 40 piano, which was an absolute revelation to me. Because if you hear it on the harpsichord, you don't hear it really until the cadenza. In this performance, and I, I loved it. I loved the way he did it. Um, you, you heard all the notes all the way through in the same way that you heard the solo flute and the solo violin. And it was a very, it was a very, um, that was an eye opener to me too. And if I was to think of a third, I would think of a third and a fourth um, because they were so close together. That was Dixit Dominus last May. Um, uh, and the whole of that concert was so much fun because we did lots of Purcell, Fairy Queen. Um, and I think we did an Albino di Double Over Concerto, which was just fabulous. Um, and then, uh, I mean, Dixit Dominus, I need to remind people is that what, what I did for my audition um, in wow. 2001. So it was the first time um, I, I'd ever met you guys. Uh, and it was, it, there it was. It was, a, it, it was quite, a, quite a difficult piece to start with because uh, technically it's very hard and you've just got to get, it's, you've just got to get it right. Um, and I'm not sure we did the first time, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And then of course I did it again about 10 years later. And then, again last year 
and that was to me that was the most successful one because we well maybe because i knew how to get it but i think the chorus was had never been as good as that uh, as it was last year <laughs> And then the next concert I did with you was um, the the uh, concert of the La Chasse with all the horns and the ram of the excerpt from the Rameau, um, the Hippolyte, which uh, I have to remind you that it was your idea um, <laughs> Jason, to do. Um, and I, because I ever think of doing an excerpt from a Rameau opera, but my goodness, uh, that was a wonderful thing to do. Uh, just it 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 just really did stand on its own, and uh, we, you know, met some met, met some new artists f through that, and that was that was great. <laughs>